Okay, for those of you who have just come to Berkeley for the first time, welcome to Berkeley. For those of you who are sophomores or more, welcome back. In any event, welcome to Psychology One, General Psychology, the introduction to the field of psychology. Um, my name is John Kilstrom. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology, and I'll be your chief content provider uh, for, the, uh, for the course this semester. Uh, here is the contact information that's, uh, that's important. It's also on your syllabus. If you are just coming in, pick up a syllabus in the back of the room. I think there are some, some still left. Uh, the blue sheets we ran out of. We'll have more on Wednesday, and they're online. More on that in, um, in a minute. Okay, this course uh, consists of lectures and discussion sections. The lectures will meet for two hours a week, Monday and Wednesday at 10.10. We'll start promptly at 10.10, and I go by that clock, not by that clock, which is always a little off. That's the official clock. Um, and we'll go through straight through until 11 o'clock every day, including today. I have some, um, I have some uh, things to talk about. Um, for those of you who are interested in them, there are Black Lightning lecture notes available for this course. I'll talk more about that in, uh, in a minute. But the lectures are Monday and Wednesday. And then you have a one-hour discussion section led by a graduate student instructor that meets once a week. These discussion sections do not meet this week. It's hard enough to get for you to get your schedules organized and have to deal with discussion sections. But they will begin next week bearing in mind that ne uh, next Monday is Labor Day. There won't be discussion sections on Labor Day, but on Tuesday, the fourth uh, discussion sections will begin. So we've got lectures, we've got the discussion, we've got some examinations, we've got a couple of other things uh, to talk about. First, let's talk about the discussion sections, which, as I said before, are going to be led by graduate student instructors. These are graduate students who are serving as teaching assistants in the course. These discussion sections will vary in format, but a typical discussion section will begin with uh, some kind of presentation by the graduate student on some uh, topic that's relevant to what we're doing uh, in class, followed by a period for question, discussions, and all of that kind of stuff. Remember, no discussion sections this week. Discussion sections start next week. Let me introduce to you the GSIs, the graduate student instructors that are um, uh, uh, affiliated with this course. First, Mario Achevis. Uh, stand up, Mario. Mario Achevis, he's in uh, developmental psychology. Uh, Melissa Adams Hunt is in cognitive neuroscience. Sarita Alexander in educational psychology. Aaron Gibson in cognitive psychology. Kate Kaplan in clinical psychology. Andres Martinez in social personality psychology, Alexander O'Connor in cognitive psychology, Sherilyn Tan in developmental psychology, and Lindsay Shaw Taylor in social psychology. So that's the group. You all get to meet them uh, next week. On the course website, about which I'll have more to say in a minute, we'll get um, uh, the uh, teaching assistants, the GSIs associated with the various sections, so you'll know uh, who, to, um, who to contact. Okay, if you're waitlisted for this course, the chances are pretty good that you're going to be able to get in. We have some slots left, but admission to the course is through discussion sections. There has to be a vacant seat in the discussion section for which you're waitlisted in order for you to move into the course, okay? Uh, that usually happens. We added three new sections of, uh, the, of the course just last week. Those are pretty vacant. If you can move into sections 125, 126, or 127, which meet Monday or Tuesday, uh, your chances of getting into the class are very, very, very uh, high. Uh, priorities given to freshmen and sophomores. The reason for that is this, is, uh, this course is a prerequisite for the psychology major. By the time you finished your sophomore year, you've already declared a major in something, uh, so you don't need this particular version of Psych 1 uh, so much. But uh, uh, we'll move people automatically off the wait list uh, into the course as seats open up uh, in accordance with their ranking on the wait list for discussion section. What matters is where you're waitlisted for the discussion section, not for the course as a whole. 
with priority given to freshmen and sophomores. So what you should do beginning next week is attend the discussion section for which you're waitlisted, okay? If you don't attend the discussion section for which you're waitlisted, there is some risk that we will think you're just not interested in the course and we'll drop you to make room for somebody who is. So beginning next week, go to the discussion section that you're enrolled in or you're waitlisted for. We'll see what we can do for you. If for some reason you can't attend discussion section next week, get in, get in contact with your GSI. We'll post those names to the website uh, probably later, uh, later today. Okay? So that should be fairly clear. I mentioned before, there is a note-taking service here uh, at the, uh, UC uh, Berkeley, uh, Black Lightning Lecture Notes. This is the only authorized note-taking service on campus. Uh, this course, being one of the uh, larger courses on campus, has a Black Lightning note-taker. Uh, these notes are not a substitute for your own notes. Educationally speaking, in terms of how people learn, there is absolutely no substitute for having your own notes that put your own spin, your own organization on things. However, if you have to miss a lecture or you want another perspective on what went on in lecture, the Black Lightning Lecture Notes uh, can be very uh, valuable. I think they cost 39 bucks for the semester, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, and you can get more information about this uh, at that... Uh, at uh, that uh, URL, uh, bln at securesites.com. Uh, okay, what about examinations? We've got three exams in this course, two midterms and a final. The two midterms are going to be administered in class. There's one in early October. There's one in mid-November. And then there's a final examination. The midterm exams are non-cumulative exams. First midterm covers everything beginning today, going right up to the first midterm. Second midterm covers everything since the first midterm, right up to the second midterm. And then the final exam will, will have a non-cumulative portion that covers everything since the second midterm, and then a cumulative portion that covers the entire class. Educationally, one test is not a good idea. We want to give you a chance to go back over the entire material. Uh, if you take a test on something the second time, it turns out that you learn things better. The final exam is scheduled for um, uh, uh, December 13th, 8, 8 to 11 o'clock in the morning. We don't know where yet, but it'll probably be some, gymna some gymnasium. All the exams in this course are multiple choice computer scored exams. That's to make sure that the scores, that the, the exams are scored reliably and fairly uh, for everyone. Despite being multiple choice computer scored, they emphasize basic concepts and principles. They don't ask you for uh, uh, nitty gritty about names and dates. Uh, we're not particularly interested in that. And the exams cover the readings and the lectures with roughly equal emphasis. I cannot, in the short time that's available to you, uh, to me, basically 30 lectures, cover all the material that's in the textbook. The, your textbook is the best introductory psychology textbook written in over 100 years. It does a wonderful job of, um, of covering uh, the, the territory, and we, uh, hold you, uh, we will hold you responsible for the material that's in that class, in, in that book as well. One important policy, there are no makeup exams in this course. Okay, so we expect you to take the exams when they're being administered. Okay, if there's some kind of family emergency, you're kind of stuck in Maui or something at your grandmother's funeral, we'll deal with that. But outside of that, we expect you to be here for, uh, for the exams. There aren't, uh, there aren't any makeups. Let's see, what else do we want to do? Oh, another component of the course is what's known as the Research Participation Program. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday, but for now, um, by virtue of department policy, the introductory and mid-level survey courses in, uh, in the psychology department all have associated with them a research participation uh, requirement. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Uh, psychology is a science. It's a laboratory science. If you were taking a course in physics or chemistry or biology, there would be a laboratory section attached to that course that would give you a chance to roll balls down an incline, blow something up by mixing chemicals, dissect a salamander or something like that. We can't do that here. We can't give you your own little pigeon or white rat to play with. We can't have you running around administering 
questionnaires to all your, um, uh, all, all your uh, dorm mates. So the research participation program is designed to allow you to see how psychological science is done, how data is collected, how experiments are conducted, and all of that at the same time uh, by participating in ongoing research projects uh, in, um, uh, that, that are uh, being conducted by faculty and graduate students in the department. In this course, uh, the requirement is five hours of research participation spread out over the course of the semester. It's not a very onerous uh, requirement. Most of the experiments uh, that, uh, um, that are part of the research participation program are pretty interesting kinds of things to do. Some of them are as straightforward as completing some survey questionnaires. Others involve you, uh, the, get you involved in doing uh, actual experiments with computers other, uh, and other kinds of machines in, um, in the laboratory. And the way you do this is by signing up uh, and you get your credits through the Research Participation Program website. The URL for that is on your syllabus. There's, a, there's also a link to it from the course website. But it looks like that. You go to, um, go to this URL right up here, psychology.berkeley/rpp. And you'll see a number of links, uh, and over here are uh, a number, another number of other links that allow you to establish an account, basically to sign in to the, for the RPP program, and also to uh, sign up for various kinds of experiments. We're going to talk about that more on Wednesday. There'll be a representative of the research participation program here to talk to you at that time. But all the information about that you need about RPP are on those blue sheets that many of you were able to pick up. Um, uh, we'll have more blue sheets on Wednesday for those of you who didn't, didn't get one today. There's also a link uh, to the blue sheet off the RPP website. So there's plenty of opportunity for you to get information about these uh, kinds of things. Okay, the textbook for the course is Psychology, pretty good title, by uh, Henry Gleitman and his, and his associates. Uh, Henry Gleitman's a longtime professor at University of Pennsylvania. He was one of my professors in graduate school. Daniel Riesberg, uh, who is a uh, psychology professor at Reed College in Oregon. And James Gross, who is a psychology professor at, uh, at, uh, at Stanford. The, uh, the, the, the version of the text we're using is the seventh edition. It's brand new. It's different from the sixth edition, different organization, different uh, authors for that matter. Uh, so the sixth edition, uh, which we've used in past editions of this course, won't uh, do, we want you to, uh, to be using the seventh edition. There is also a study guide for the seventh edition of uh, uh, Gleitman Psychology by um, uh, uh, Gleitman, Riesberg, and Gross, John Janitis, who's at uh, University of Michigan, and Paul Rosen, who's one of Gleitman's colleagues at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this study guide is very, very, very useful. It has little quizzes, little exercises, fill-in-the-blank kinds of things that will help you to uh, improve your mastery of the material uh, in the course. Uh, the textbook is required. The study guide is recommended, but it is very highly recommended. It's a very, very, very good uh, resource. Uh, the third thing we want you to get are uh, what are called ZAPs the Norton Psychology Labs. This is basically a password to an online um, uh, a set of laboratory exercises. You will do eight of these in the course of the, uh, of the uh, uh, course this semester. Um, there, are more, there are more details about that in the, um, uh, in the syllabus. But basically, uh, when you buy this thing, you get a, a password that allows you to register for the Norton Psychology Labs. Why are they called ZAPs? Well, these labs were actually developed by a group of Dutch researchers, and ZAPs is the Dutch abbreviation for psychology labs, okay? Um, <laughs> the, don't ask me, I'm not Dutch, right? But that's basically what it means. Uh, but in any event, uh, all three of these items, the textbook, the study guide, and the password for ZAPs, we have arranged to be packaged in a single unit uh, that's available at a deeply discounted price at the ASUC bookstore, okay? 
Uh, you might be able to get it someplace else, uh, but I know you can get it at the ASUC bookstore, all shrink-wrapped together at a reduced price. Uh, we're very good customers for Norton, and they give us the best price um, that, uh, that, they, that they possibly can. So uh, wherever you get it, what you want to do is make sure you get the textbook, uh, which is required, the ZAPS password, which is required, the study guide, get it or not, but I really, really, really uh, recommend it. Okay, so what happens when you uh, get your ZAPS password? You go to the ZAPS URL. There's a, a, a link to it off the course website. What you want to do is to um, register over here. Click into register. Once you register, that takes you to a page where you can enter the site or to update your account settings. Notice down here that there's a place for you to input your class ID. You must input a class ID, okay? Uh, otherwise, I have no way of giving you credit for the Zaps Labs that you, um, that you complete. That's the class ID. It's also on your syllabus. It's also on the course website. But make sure when you update your account settings that you put in your class ID and you put in this particular class ID before you complete any, uh, any Zaps Lab exercises. Okay, uh, here's, after you enter the site, you get a screen that looks like this with a whole bunch of uh, exercises. You can do as many of these as you want. They're great fun. It's probably better than going out drinking on Friday night. Um, uh, that's what I do on Friday night. I do these things. But there are eight specific ones that are required, okay? And those specific eight ZAPS, ZAPS exercises are the ones that are indicated in your syllabus. Do as many as you want, but you got to do those eight, uh, and you only get credit for doing uh, those, uh, those eight. Okay, this course is webcast. That is the lectures with me, and that uh, are, uh, the, the video is available. Uh, it's also available on podcast, I think on iTunes or something uh, like that. In any event, if you go to the webcast website, scroll down, and you'll see a listing for Psychology One, an indication that we're both webcast and podcast. If you have to miss a lecture, or if uh, something went by too fast or whatever, you want another crack at it, uh, you'll be able to get that resource uh, off, the, um, off the web. Another uh, resource we have for the class uh, is a website that is maintained by W.W. Norton, the publisher of your textbook, with all sorts of interesting things, uh, psychology-related uh, news articles, uh, exercises, uh, little um, uh, essays on various topics. Uh, again, there is a, uh, there's the URL that's in your syllabus as well. If you buy the text unused, you get a password to the Norton website for free. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can purchase one if you want, and then you just access the site, and it takes you over to a page with all sorts of interesting uh, 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 things on it for studying, mastery, uh, enhanced learning, and all of that good stuff. We, this course also has its own website in BSpace, which is an instructional website that's maintained by Berkeley and a number of... Um, Okay, maintained by Berkeley and a number of, uh, of uh, associated universities. If you are registered for the course or you're waitlisted, you will automatically have access to this class's uh, website on eSpace. Okay, um, at some point when we're no longer bring, taking students off the waitlist, uh, waitlisted students will lose access. But if you're enrolled, you're automatically given access to this website. So what you want to do is point your browser at this URL, and uh, once you log in over here, you'll go. You'll be taken to a, a a page that looks like this that will list all the courses for which you're enrolled or waitlisted that have BSpace websites. Okay, and this will be one of them. Uh, so you just click on that, and then you'll be taken to a page that looks like this. Uh, there's a navigation bar down the left-hand side. There are some notes here. Uh, here's the, class, the course ID for the ZAPS lab exercises. 
There's a little calendar here where you can see what's going to be happening. There are announcements over here. And as I say, there is a navigation bar. This is a blow up of the navigation bar. There's a copy of the syllabus, a record of, of, a, a record of all the announcements in the class. Here you can check your grades as you accumulate them over the course of the semester. The forum is a discussion board. If you have any questions about the lectures or readings, post your question to the, uh, 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 to the forum, and you'll get a response from me or maybe one of the GSIs uh, relatively quickly. Here's a link that'll take you to all the illustrations that I use in my lectures, so you can get a chance to look at those again. Here's another link that takes you to lecture supplements, which are basically things I'd love to talk about if I could have you forever, but since I don't, I've written them up, uh, and uh, you'll see lecture su supplements for each of the lectures here with a lot of additional material. This link on exam information takes you to a page that describes the philosophy of examinations in this course, how the examinations are scored, how grades are calculated. It also takes you to a page that's got all previous exams in this class, okay? So you can get some sense of the kinds of questions I ask with answers, mostly the right answers, okay? Well, sometimes, you know, there's a slip and I just didn't catch it, uh, but I think they're mostly the, uh, the correct answers. Uh, here's a link to the course webcast. Here's a link to the RPP program website. There's a link to the ZAPS website. Here's a link to the Gleitman uh, webbook. Uh, and here's a link for section info. Within a day or so, um, the section info will be complete and we'll have information about uh, which GSIs are working with which, um, uh, which sections. Okay, how do we calculate grades? There are 340 points available uh, for this course. The midterms are worth 50 points each, so there's 100 points right there. The final exam is worth 100 points. Uh, section, uh, discussion sections worth 100 points. Discussion sections are a scarce resource, so they're valuable, okay? Um, so those 100 points are gonna be determined in large part by attendance and participation. Uh, that's 60 points for section. And then completion of the ZAPS exercises is going to give you another 40 points. That's eight ZAPS exercises into 40 points, five points for ZAPS exercise, and then 40 more points for your five uh, research uh, participation uh, credits. Here are the grading standards for the class, traditional industry standard. If you accumulate at least 90% of available points, you're guaranteed some kind of A. Accumulate at least 80%, guaranteed some kind of B. 51% or more guarantees you some kind of C. Uh, if you're breathing, you can accumulate 51% or more of these points. <laughs> Pretty much. You've got to breathe regularly, okay? <laughs> I do that deliberately. I don't want there to be any pressure on people about, oh, gee, am I going to get a D, am I going to get an F? Almost certainly not. You really have to screw up with me to get a D or an F, okay? But, you know, if you get into psychology and you find out, oh, it's boring or it just is too complicated or whatever, okay, the worst that's going to happen to you is some kind of C, all right? Um, but uh, these are, as I say, industry standard, grading standards. What I do when I go to set the final distribution of grades I check my distribution of grades against the distribution of grades in other introductory courses in the biological and social sciences, and I make sure that my distribution matches them. Okay? So you'll do a, the class will do as well in this class as classes do in general on average. My grading standards are neither more liberal nor more strict than they are at the rest, um, in, in the rest of the campus. Okay. All right. Any, we're, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what psychology is all about, but for now, any questions about the organization and format of the course? Yes? The ZAPS exercises are graded on completion? The ZAPS exercises are graded on completion. I get notified by ZAPS when you've completed your ZAPS, okay? There are deadlines for each of these, okay? Then it takes a couple of days for the feedback to get to me. It takes me a couple of days to get the thing up on the grade book, but basically it's all done automatically, okay? And it's um, all or none. You complete it or not, 
If you complete it, you get five points. If you don't, you yeah, don't. Yes? Well, that is the curve, okay? We, you're just accumulating points, right? So there's 50 points for every midterm, for each of the midterms, 100 points for the, uh, for the, for the final. We don't set the curve until the very end, okay? Uh, but as I say, if you accumulate 90% 90, 90 of the points, you are guaranteed some kind of A, no matter what the curve is. I might loosen the curve, but I will never tighten it, okay? 90% guarantees some kind of A, 80% guarantees some kind of B. Question back here. Well, if there's some reason for you not to be in discussion section, talk to your GSI and you can work it out. No, that don't, there's no makeup for Labor Day because there's no discussion section on Labor Day. Yeah, and you'll notice that at the very end, the last day of class is a Monday. Okay, so that's not an issue. Okay, go, like Thanksgiving, go home for Thanksgiving if your discussion section is on Thursday or Friday. <laughs> Because that's where your GSI is. Yes? What's the difference between the ZAPS exercises and the research? The ZAPS exercises are for this class, okay? They're not experiments in the sense that you're not creating data for science. These are laboratory demonstrations, okay? And that's what, just want you to have a lot of exposure to various kinds of things in the class. The RPP is one way to do it. ZAPS is another way to do it. But they're independent of each other. Okay, one more question, yeah? Um, yeah. I'll be using the seventh edition of Gleitman until there's an eighth edition, okay? Uh, I'm extremely loyal to my old professor. Uh, the passwords will be good forever as far as I can tell, okay? Anything else? Yes? My office hours, they were on the first slide, Monday and Wednesday, 11 to 12, but not today. Okay, I've got, a, I've got something I have to do at 11 o'clock uh, uh, today. Office hours are also available by appointment. Furthermore, I try to get here at least 10 minutes before class. I try to stay until the last of you leaves after class. So if you have any difficulty uh, making office hours, nobody shows up for office hours because they're never convenient for most people, just send me an email, we can make an appointment, we can probably do whatever we need to, whatever, transact whatever business we need to transact over email. Anything else about the organization and format of the course? Yes? The alternative task, if you're not, it, it all depends. If you turn 18 by the end of September, you got plenty of time to do RPP, okay? If you turn 18 on October 1st or after, Probably not, okay? Uh, so um, there's an alternative assignment that involves doing some, some additional ZAPS exercises, okay? So if you're under 18, don't worry about it. We've got you covered, okay? Yeah? No, there's no mechanism for that. It's just that the RPP is not built to do that. It's a, it's a zero-based budget, uh, if you will. Uh, anything else about the organization and format of the course? Yes. No, no, that would just kill your back, okay? So, no, you don't have to bring the textbook to class. I don't, like, read to you from the textbook or anything like that. I, I had a professor do that once, right? Um, but uh, that's, not, that's not my style. So I would just leave them in your, leave that stuff in your, um, uh, in your room. Once in a while, your uh, GSI might ask you to bring the text to discussion section, but not very often. Something back here. The BSpace web, whenever I update something on the BSpace website, I try to remember to send an email announcement to everybody, okay? But the discussion board, that's not something that you get a natural e email announcement on. That's something you just ought to get in the habit of checking, okay? If you post a question there, well, check for the response. Um, but I think when you start poking around on the BSpace website, you're going to find it's a pretty damn good website, okay? It's got a lot of resources on it. I spend a lot of time on it. 
Uh, so I, if there's feedback, give me feedback. Mostly positive <laughs> feedback. Anything else? Yes. Yes, right here in the T-shirt. Work with the, if you have a discussion and you want to switch discussion times, we can almost certainly do that informally. Okay, so deal with your GSI about that. You might be able to move into one of his or her other discussion sections. At the, that's the easiest thing to do. Or swap with somebody else. We can arrange that too. Whatever you do, unless you're going into uh, sections 125, 126, or 127, do not drop your discussion section, because what will happen is telebearers will kick you out of the class and put you in the bottom of the waiting list. Okay? So we'll do all of that informally beginning next week. Okay? Anything else? Have I left anything out? Where? 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 Yes? Are there any extra credit opportunities? No. No extra credit opportunities. Um, and the reason for that is it's just not fair. Some of you have a lot of time on your hands. Others of you have... Uh, five-person families and you're holding down three jobs. It, uh, extra credit's just not fair. Um, no Starbucks for you? Huh? No Starbucks for you? No Starbucks for me, no. I don't drink coffee, actually. So. <laughs> Although you'll find that I dress like a blockbuster clerk. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so what are we going to be doing in this course? William James, who wrote the best psychology textbook besides Gleitman, um, great American philosopher, pioneering American uh, psychologist, defined psychology as the science of mental life. The whole point of psychology is to describe the nature and function of mental structures and processes, the mental structures and processes that underlie human experience, thought, and action. Psychology is the science of mental life. It tries to understand how the mind works. What do we mean by mental life? Well, no better description of what the mind does exists, I think, than the one offered by German philosopher Immanuel Kant more than 200 years ago, said there are three things that the mind does. It knows things, it feels things, and it desires things. There are three absolutely irreducible faculties of mind, knowledge, feeling, and desire. Great 20th century psychologist Ernest Hilgard, Jack Hilgard, put it another way, he talked about what he called the trilogy of mind. Uh, of cognition having to do with knowing things and believing things, of emotion having to do with feelings, affects, moods, and motivation having to do with needs and goals and purposes, drives, desires, all of that kind of stuff. So what psychology tries to understand is how we engage in these kinds of mental activities, how we know things, where feelings come from, what's the nature of motivation, and, um, and so on. So the scope of psychology is very broad, and so is the scope of this course. We will focus mostly on basic mental processes, try to figure out how the mind works, and in this course, because we don't have a unlimited amount of time, we're going to focus mostly on basic cognitive processes, how we get knowledge and acquire knowledge and use knowledge. In addition, psychology is interested in things like where the mind comes from. So we're going to be talking about developmental psychology for a little while, how mind arose through biological evolution, how mind changes through the development of the individual. For a lot of the course, we'll be talking about mind in general, how perception and memory and thinking and reasoning work in general. But psychology is also interested in individual differences, in how each individual is unique with respect to uh, the organization of his or her mental life. We all have somewhat different beliefs, somewhat different somewhat different desires, somewhat different reactions to what goes on around us. These individual differences in mental life 
are a very important aspect of what psychology is all about. Towards the end of the semester, we'll talk about pathology of mental life, so-called psychopathology, what the various disorders of, mental, uh, of, of mind look like, schizophrenia, uh, uh, depression, anxiety disorders, whatever uh, those various mental illnesses are. And then finally, in addition to being a basic science, psychology is an applied science. We're not just interested in how the mind works in the abstract. Psychologists are interested in taking what we know about how the mind works and applying this knowledge in various domains to education, to help the process of teaching and learning be as good as it can be, in psychotherapy for the prevention and treatment of various forms of mental illness, in the workplace to help managers be more effective, to help workers be more productive. Psychology as a science of mental life is both a basic science that tries to understand how the mind works and an applied science that seeks to make that knowledge useful in, um, uh, in, various, uh, in various ways. So what kind, of psycho what kind of science is psychology? Well, psychology is first and foremost what we call a behavioral science. There are a number of these behavioral sciences, like anthropology and economics and political science and sociology, uh, each of which has a somewhat different approach to understanding the behavior of the, in, of the individual organism, whether that's a human organism or an animal organism, as, it, as uh, the individual interacts with uh, other individuals and with the, uh, and, and with the surrounding uh, environment. That's all the behavioral sciences are interested in that, but each of these behavioral sciences takes a somewhat different approach to understanding behavior. And in psychology, what we're particularly interested in is the mental processes that, uh, that lead people to behave the way they do. The basic rationale for psychology as a science is to be found in a philosophical doctrine known as mentalism, or sometimes known as mental causation, which stated formally basically says that mental states are to action as cause to effect. That is, mental, the individual's mental states cause him or her to do the things that he or she does. The cause, okay, you, you behave the way you do because you think or feel or desire the, uh, the things uh, that, uh, that you do. So, for example, consider a um, fairly dramatic example behavior. A person commits suicide. The question is, why did somebody do that? Why did he or she behave in that particular way? A psychological explanation always explains behavior in terms of the individual's mental states. So, for example, we could give a cognitive explanation for this behavior in terms of what the individual knows, knew, or what the individual believes. So perhaps this person committed suicide because he believed he was of no value. Or we could give an emotional explanation of that individual's behavior in terms of his or her emotions, affects, moods, or feelings. So perhaps a person committed suicide because he or she felt depressed. Feelings, not knowing, not believing, a feeling explaining behavior. Or we might give a motivational explanation for that individual's behavior in terms of his or her drives, needs, goals, or so on, so that perhaps the person committed suicide because he no longer had the desire to live. Psychological explanations of behavior are always in terms of knowledge, feeling, or desire. Always in terms of the individual's cognitive, emotional, or motivational states. So when we try to think about what kind of science psychology is, you find out pretty quickly that psychology is a social science. And the reason for that is all behavioral sciences try to understand the behavior of the individual, but the individual lives in a social environment. We are social beings. We live in a world of other people, 
uh, with whom we interact, we cooperate, we compete with these individuals. So psychology as a social science tries to understand the relation between the individual and the social world in which he or she lives. So you'll find psychologists looking at various aspects of social interaction, how we interact with each other for cooperation and competition, how we understand other people, uh, how groups and organizations influence the behavior of the individual. Personality and individual differences also usually thought of as part of psychology as a social science. So psychology is a social science and it's also a biological science. Just as psychology is a social science because the individual, because humans are social creatures, psychology is a biological science because we understand that the brain is the physical basis of mind. And so if you want to understand how the mind works, you probably ought to understand a little bit about how the brain works. So uh, in this course, we'll do a little bit of neuroanatomy, a little neurophysiology. We'll talk a little bit about how the nervous system relates to other bodily systems like the endocrine system and the, uh, and the immune system. Uh, molecular and cellular biology, as you'll see, is also relevant uh, to psychology. Genetics, um, evolutionary biology, also relevant to psychology. But finally, uh, ecology which looks at the relation between organisms and the environment is also something that psychologists have interest in, especially the relationship between the individual and the social environment. So psychology is a social science. It's also a biological science. In some sense, it's also a physical science because the brain is a physical chemical system. It operates uh, according to uh, basically electrochemical um, uh, principles and one of the most important new tools for psychology are a set of devices, a set of devices that allow us to um, in various ways image the brain, take pictures of the brain while people are engaged in mental activities. So because the brain is the physical basis of mind and the brain is an electrochemical system, psychology also counts to some extent as a physical science. The fact that psychology can be thought of as a biological and maybe a physical science in some respects raises the question of reductionism. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes by, from Ernest Rutherford, a uh, typical attitude on the part of people like him. There's only one science, that's physics. All the rest is stamp collecting. Um, never mind that Rutherford himself won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He seems to have had some self-hate uh, there. But there is a tendency among some scientists to think that what, if, if, if you really got a science, you ought to be able to reduce the principles of psychology to principles of biology and principles of biology in turn to principles of uh, physics. And one of the underlying questions in psychology, one that you might grapple with in your discussion sections, is whether uh, that can actually happen uh, or not. To what extent? can we reduce the principles of psychology to the principles of um, uh, particles operating in fields of, uh, of force. My own view is that that's not the right way to do uh, psychology. Rather, I prefer that you think of there being different levels at which we can explain various aspects of behavior. There is the psychological level of explanation in terms of the individual underlying mental states, cognitive, emotional, and motivational states. However, you can also give a socio-cultural explanation of behavior of the kind favored by economists and sociologists and anthropologists that explains the behavior of the individual in terms of socio-cultural structures and practices, what's going on in the society that the person's a member of, what's going on in the culture that the person's a member of, or you can give an explanation of behavior uh, in biophysical terms in terms of things like neurotransmitters, genes, and hormones. These are all related to each other in some ways, but what I want you to think of, the, the, the view I want you to think about in this class is that each of these levels is a legitimate explanation of behavior in its own right.
Okay? A physical explanation or a biological explanation of behavior is no better than a psychological explanation of behavior. It's just a different kind of explanation. Psychologists explain behavior in terms of the individual's mental states. Um, and as I say, you know, other, other sciences might do it differently. So, for example, we could explain behavior psychologically in terms of the individual's knowledge, feelings, and desires, or we could give uh, an explanation of that same behavior in terms of something sociocultural, that he was in a group and his leader told him to do it. Whether you're a Japanese kamikaze pilot in World War II or a member of the Jonestown cult in Guyana uh, just, about, uh, just about 20 years ago, the explanation of those suicides is to be found in the cultural surround of the individual. Or you could give a biophysical explanation by uh, thinking, well, maybe there's some genetic predisposition to suicide, and that accounts for why somebody does it. These different levels of explanation are all of equal status. In psychology, we favor the psychological level of explanation in terms of knowledge, feeling, and desire. Okay? So think about psychology standing in the center of things Okay, connecting down to the biophysical level of explanation because the brain is the physical basis of mind and connecting up to the sociocultural level of explanation because the individual is embedded in a wider social uh, context. In the end, psychology connects up with lots of different fields of inquiry. Psychology uh, shares with... Um, uh, uh, the philosophy and the theology and literature and art, fundamental questions about the nature of human existence and how the individual's experience is shared with others. Psychology shares with economics and sociology and history and anthropology a concern with the relations of individuals to society. It shares with biology and physiology and physical anthropology the relation between the individual and other creatures, and it shares with uh, uh, physics and chemistry and cosmology an interest in the place of the individual in the universe as a whole. These other fields of inquiry, physics, chemistry, biology, sociology, anthropology, study the world outside the individual, whether it's the physical world or the social world. Psychology studies what Morton Hunt once called the universe within the individual, the universe that exists within the individual mind. We'll begin talking about all of these things and more on Wednesday when we begin to look at the brain as the physical basis of the mind. Thank you very much.